going to jump right in here. Uh, I want to use this outline to sort of help you keep track of what we've gone through, what we're going to go through. Hopefully it's a help to you. Brother Elvin, can I steal one of those from you? Is that okay? Let's see here. Let me get, there we go. Thank you. Um, so we're in chapter number two. We're talking about the ministry and the second advent. The ministry and the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what advent means, all right? Uh, think of it this way. An avenue is a, is a way that you go, right? So advent is a coming. It's, it's a, a coming or going, if you will, depending on what direction you're at. Uh, and so when we talk about the ministry and the second advent, we're talking about the ministry and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, um, as you're in 2 Thessalonians, uh, I want you to keep in, or 1 Thessalonians, sorry about that, chapter 2, I want you to keep in mind that the theme of the Bible is a king and his kingdom. So what you'll find in prophecy specifically is that most of the, the prophetic references in the Old Testament, uh, talking about Jesus Christ coming, most of them, uh, the majority of them, I would say, has to do with the second coming. I, I can't remember how it breaks down. I want to say it's probably close to 70-30, 70% being about his second coming, 30% being about his first coming. And there's amazing prophecy and, on both sides. Uh, but it's important to understand that the theme of the Bible is the Lord getting what's rightfully His, a king receiving His kingdom. So it should be no surprise that when Paul writes a, a young group of believers that he infuses into the conversation very early on the subject of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because it's a consistent theme through the Bible. All right. Now, uh, the first 12 verses of this chapter, are, are there's a lot of practical stuff here as it relates to the ministry itself. Um, the ministers of the Thessalonians, and that's what we're looking at from verses 1 to 12. All right? And uh, last week we went through uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, and uh, your first uh, point on your study guide, if you will, it says, what are the other two places that the phrase not in vain shows up in the New Testament? Does anybody remember where those are at? All right, I'll give them to you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, and 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. And uh, the second question uh, in the outline here in the study guide uh, has to do with those verses. Well, really, all three places that not in vain shows up, they all have to do with a Christian service to the Lord. All right? So in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, in verse number 10, he says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. All right? So the not in vain has to do with your labor, and, and really just sticking with it and being faithful with the ministry God's given you. Now, you might think, I don't have a ministry. Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> you go, are we, are we short? Okay, here we go. Uh, how many short are we? Four. Four? Oh, man. Okay. Got one. Everyone's like, I don't need mine anymore. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Sorry we're short, guys. I'll, I'll uh, you know, I guess next time, don't come to church and we'll have enough, okay? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I am kidding. I am kidding. Uh, yeah, first time I heard that. That's right. Uh, but uh, again, that phrase, not in vain, in the New Testament is associated with your labor to the Lord. All right? Um, uh, number three says, verse two mentions being shamefully entreated. All right? Shamefully entreated. And he mentions that it happened in Philippi. Does anybody remember what passage of Scripture that was where Paul was shamefully entreated? Acts 16, that's right, that was where he comes in contact with the Philippian jailer. He's in Philippi, and he's been wrongfully imprisoned, all right? Um, in verse 2, uh, it says there, uh, at the end of the verse, or toward the latter half of the verse, it says, we were bold, we were bold, all right? That's one of the signs of discipleship, and we talked about that. So it, under number 4, where it says in verse 2, we learned that we were, and the, the fill in the blank there is bold, and that's important because that's one of the signs of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Now listen to me and listen well. There's a difference between being saved and being a Christian. All right? You can be saved and not be following Jesus Christ. Now some people go, well, I don't believe that's true. All right, well, get, let's talk Scripture for a second. Is your flesh saved right now? Your flesh isn't saved until the rapture. Your soul is saved right now. You're seated in heavenly places with Christ. 
The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 that there's an operation of God made without hands. This may sound crazy to some of you, but the Bible talks about it being a circumcision. Now it's a spiritual one, all right? You understand there's a physical one from the Old Testament. You read about that in Genesis. There's a spiritual one in Colossians 2 where the Bible says there, you know what, let's go there. Go to Colossians 2. And uh, it's important to understand, it's important to get a hold of this. Because the, the, the problem that a lot of people have when they, they talk about, uh, for example, I don't think a, a person could be saved and do X, Y, and Z, is that they're forgetting that a, a person being saved has to do with the grace of God being bestowed on them. It has nothing to do with their character. Matter of fact, I heard a preacher say it like this, salvation fixes your eternal destiny, but it doesn't fix your character like that. Now, some people say this. Some people say, well, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And so if they're a new creature, then things should change. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do you still sin? Yeah. Well, then you're not a new creature. You must not be saved. So which sins are the ones that you would say delineate that you're a new creature? You understand what I'm saying? What it boils down to, typically what people do, they get into this exercise where in the end, what they're really saying is, if you haven't quit the bad habits that I've quit, you must not be saved. Now there's a line, there's a difference between being saved and being a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me put it to you this way. If any man will, take up his cross and follow me, what? Daily. That's discipleship. That's Christian living. Salvation is a point in time, you must be born again, where you trusted Christ as your Savior. Aren't you thankful that it's, it's simple? It, that's a blessing. Thank God that he, he did all the work for us. I mean, He did. Uh, look at Colossians chapter 2, though. Uh, we talk about spiritual circumcision, so no one thinks I'm coming up with some new hokey doctrine. It's here in the Bible, okay? Uh, Colossians 2, look if you would, at verse number 11. In whom also ye are circumcised... Now listen, stop real quick right here. He, who is he talking to? Colossians. Not a bunch of Jewish people for the most part, primarily Gentiles. G Gentiles were not circumcised physically. He's talking primarily to Gentile saved people. And he says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision, look at this, underline it, made without hands. You say, what is that? It's spiritual. The, the circumcision from the Old Testament is a physical one made with hands. There's a surgery process, right? But here it's one made without hands. Look at what it, how it describes this circumcision. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. All right? So there it mentions that the circumcision, the spiritual circumcision, if you will, that happens when you get saved, has to do with the body of the sins of the flesh being cut away. Well, what is circumcision? It's a cutting away. So it is a cutting away of the body from what? From the eternal, aspect, the eternal part of you. What's the eternal part of you? Your soul. So this is why in the Old Testament, so many times when it talks about the soul that sinneth, it shall die. You guys remember that in Ezekiel? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Here's the blessing. If you're saved today, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, your soul cannot sin. Thank God for that. Because if your soul could sin, guess what? You'd have lost your salvation years ago. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, the reason why you can't is because the body and the soul are no longer connected together. Now, the reason it's important to understand that is because a lot of people, um, I, I, I'll put it to you this way, the typical Baptist response to, you know, uh, trying to defend once saved, always saved is hallelujah. Speaking of once saved, always saved, <laughs> put that up, brother. Let everybody see that. That's, that's spirit-filled candy right there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Uh, it's good stuff, man. Uh, but uh, anyways, uh, man, that threw me off. Sorry, guy. <laughs> I got in the flesh for a moment. See? See, it shows you can be saved and get in the flesh. Uh, yeah, amen. Uh, but as it relates to this, what a lot of Baptists do is they'll say, well, the Bible says that you're in the Father's hands. No man can pluck you out of the Father's hands. And they go to verses like that. Nothing wrong with that. There's, that's good, good stuff. The problem is for every verse that shows you you're saved forever, there's about three or four that show that you can lose your salvation. Now, typically, here's what I'll tell you. I know I'm going off a little bit on a tangent here, but bear with me. I think it's good sound doctrine for you. Here's what I've learned. Uh, typically, when people try to prove you can lose your salvation, they're going to go to Matthew or one of the Gospels. They're going to go to the book of Acts or maybe Hebrews. Rarely will someone try to prove you can lose your salvation from going to Paul's writings. Why is that? Because it's really clear from Paul's writings 
the, the apostle to the uncircumcision, to the Gentiles, that when you're saved, you're saved forever. Now, if you go to Matthew, I, I know this is a totally different conversation from Thessalonians, but if you go into Matthew and the Gospels, here's what you have to keep in mind. Jesus Christ, the majority of what's in the Gospels is not even New Testament. You go, oh, but wait, my Bible says New Testament, Matthew chapter 1. I know how it's laid out in the Bible. I get that. I'm not disrespecting the canon and how it's laid out. What I am saying is as far as God is concerned, God says that without the death of the testator, there can be no testament. So most of what you're reading in the, in the Gospels is not New Testament. You say, why? Because Christ hadn't died yet. There's a lot of practical things, and there's a lot of things you can learn from it. I'm not saying that. The Bible, is, the, the Bible says uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Amen? Amen? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What you have to do as a child of God is rightly divide and make sure you don't take something that's not written to you and try to apply it to yourself doctrinally. That's where a lot of people go off. Now, why did I mention all of this? Well, because later on we're going to see... Uh, that when we talk about the second coming, there's a lot of different views that people have. Some people think that you get, uh, you know, if you're not living right at the time of the rapture, you get left behind. There's reasons they think that from Scripture. And I'll, I'll try to walk through that and show you why that's not right for the church, okay? Um, thank God, according to the New Testament, according to what you read, uh, we are not going to get left. If you're saved this morning, you don't get left behind. Amen. You, might, you might go kicking and screaming and in love with the world, but you're going when He calls you. All right, And I heard a preacher say it like this, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways to go. Uh, some Christians choose to fly first class, and some go coach. Now let me ask you a question. If, if United Airlines, this is the, the people that I typically use because I have a, one of those cars with mileage things, you know, whatever. If they called me, and it's never happened, <laughs> but if they called me and said, hey, we're going to upgrade you to first class, I'm not going to be like, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay in coach, really. <laughs> You know what I'm doing? I'm jumping at the chance to go first class. You say, why? It's nice. More room. You know, I, I watch these commercials from the 50s. We'll get back to Thessalonians in a second, okay? <laughs> I watch these airline commercials from the 50s, and, you know, it's like, hello, would you like to try to, uh, flying with us on Pan Am? And, you know, the, everyone's, and, and, like, you know, they bring real food. It's not airplane food. It's real food. And, you know, there's, like, this much room between you and the seat in front of you. Everyone's wearing suits. It's high class. Now you're like this, stuck on the plane, you know, and, and you just feel like you're a sardine in a can. And if they tell me I can go first class, I'm jumping at the chance. Listen, Christian, if you're saved, you're going regardless in the rapture. Some Christians choose to go first class and some don't, depending on how they live their life. But you're still going to go. Um, so I, I want to get this out of the way, though, because I think it's important to understand that the part of you that is saved when you trusted Christ as your Savior is sealed, as the Bible says, until the day of redemption, Ephesians 4, verse 32. All right? Uh, go back, if you would. Now, we, I, I told you there was a spiritual circumstances in the Bible. Was I lying? We just read it, right? Colossians chapter 2, verse number 11. All right? So go back to uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You say things like that, and, and what I've learned is this. Um, a lot of Christians today, they don't read their Bible often. They don't do it on a, on a regular basis. And so when you mention something like that, you say there is something called spiritual circumcision where the body is cut away from the soul when you get saved. A lot of people go, what in the world is he talking about? So I like to go there so you can see I'm not just, I'm crazy for other reasons, all right? <laughs> but not, not for that one, all right? First Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, we'll look at verse number 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. And the Bible has a lot to say about exhortation. You know what an exhortation is? It's like being stirred up. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's exactly how Peter describes it. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And his exhortation, he says there, was not uh, of deceit. It was honest. Nor of uncleanness. The motive was pure. It was for their good that he exhorted them. Nor in guile. As you turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, you might remember that Nathaniel... Uh, not Nathaniel St. John, although he would like that, right? Uh, when uh, Jesus uh, uh, gets to meet Nathaniel, you know what he says about him? Here's an Israelite in whom is no guile. There's no, there's no false pretense. There's no fake. There's, it's just here's what you get. All right? Uh, and I think the Lord appreciates that about people. Look at 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. 
And when you talk about guile, that's what that is. It, it's a, a, a lack of sincerity. There's a pretense there because the motive isn't right. There's a pretense there because behind what's actually said, there's a motive that's manipulative. And what Paul is saying is, look, we didn't come to you that way. And again, what you have to keep in mind is that uh, chapter 2 of Thessalonians, the first 12 verses, Paul is describing the ministry that he had to the people that he's writing to. And he's trying to remind them, look, you, you guys remember, uh, we didn't come to you under any false pretense. It wasn't because of uncleanness. Uh, it wasn't because we were trying to lie to you. We came, we told you the truth because we love you. Uh, and you're going to see that later on as we go through the rest of the chapter. Second Peter chapter 1, talking about exhortation. Exhortation. Now, before I read this, let me just say this. You ought to get excited when you're at church. Amen. It, it should be okay. It shouldn't be strange to go to church and someone says amen. I've been in churches, man. I'll never forget when I was a missionary years ago on deputation. We go to a church, and, you know, I don't know them. They don't know me. And we'd be singing a song, and I'd get excited and say, Woo! Amen. And everyone turns around. Who's the weirdo? You know, who invited that guy? And then they're looking at me like, ew, what is it? And then they get surprised when I walk forward. I'm the one that's preaching that day. They're like, oh, that guy, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I did, that happened several times with deputation. But it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be strange to be excited at church. It shouldn't be that way. I mean, guys, I, I know I've mentioned it quite a bit, and you're probably tired of me mentioning it. But uh, at this time of year, people get excited about a guy running around in tights catching a ball. Everybody thinks it's normal. And er you know what they do? They put their flags up. You know, back in the, in the 60s, you know what a girl would do when she was dating a guy and they were going steady? She'd wear his jacket. You know what men do now? They wear Aaron Rodgers jerseys. You know, you're going steady with Aaron Rodgers, you know. Uh, and, well, we think nothing of it. We think nothing of it, right? We think that's just normal. It's fine. Why? Because everybody does it. And everyone's talking about the game. They get ready for it. They get dressed for it. Their minds are thinking about it. They have parties for it. They plan for it, guys. They plan to watch the game. You say, what is that? That is devotion. That is religious devotion. You understand that? And so when it comes to getting excited about the things of God, man, I'll tell you what. When someone tells me, well, you just don't know my personality. I'm just a quiet person. I know this. I would, there's, a, there's a button somewhere. That'll get you going. I don't know what it is. It's different for everybody. And typically when someone tells me that with a straight face and they're married, I say, let me talk to your spouse. I'll find that button. I'll find that excitement somewhere. <laughs> now listen, you want to get excited about the things of God. You should allow yourself to come to church and let the preaching of the Word of God and the singing of these songs stir you up. All right, look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. And look what Peter says here in verse number 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Well, Peter, why are you going to waste your breath going over something that they know and something that they're established in? You say, why? Because people need to hear it again. You know what? I think you should get excited every time you hear about Jesus Christ dying for your sins. I think you just get excited every time you hear about the fact that your God became a man, he lived a sinless life, he died for your sins, and he rose up from the grave. Amen? They should do something for you. Uh, Peter says, look, I'm going to write you about some things that you already know, that you're already doing. Uh, look at verse 13. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, talking about his body, to, put, to stir you up. How? By putting you in remembrance. You know what Paul is doing when he writes the Thessalonians? He's saying, look, let me remind you that when we came and we told you these things, we exhorted you and we had the right motive. We did it for your good. And let me remind you again of these things. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you this much at work. You know what they do all the time? They have safety meetings. You know, most of these things are common sense, really. You know, uh, there's a machine guard. All right. Don't stick your finger in a running saw. Does someone need to be, well, some people probably need to be told that. Uh, but you know what they'll do? They'll tell you again and again and again and again. You say, why? Because they want you to be safety conscious. You know what I want you to be? I want you to be Christ conscious. And I want to stir you up. You say, why? Because that's what Peter did. That's what Paul did. Uh, look what Peter says in verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Now, what is P Peter talking about? He's talking about back there in, uh, 
in Acts, or John, I believe, John, where he restores Peter back into the discipleship. Peter denies the Lord, and then they're sitting at the fire, and the Lord says, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? Do you love me? All that. And, uh, and at the end there, he says, uh, hey, let me tell you a little bit about how you're going to go. You're going to have to have people hold you by the hand. When you get older, this is going to happen. So Peter's getting to the end of his life, and he's remembering what the Lord told him. And he's going, I, I must be at the end of my life or getting towards the end of my life. And he says, shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle. And, and he uh, uh, associates that with what the Lord showed him about the end of his life. And as he's getting to the end of his life, you know what he does? He goes back to things that they already know, and he says, I'm going to tell you again. You see why? Because you need to hear him. Now, you parents, ever tell your kids something, and they go, oh, I know. And you're like, yeah, but you still leave the lights on. Or, yeah, but you still don't flush the toilet. Or, yeah, but you still don't leave the bathroom clean. Whatever the case might be. Yeah, Dad, I know, I know. You know, but you're not doing it. Now, Christian, how many things do you know about God that we just, we're not doing anything with? And you know what Peter says? Look, I know you know these things. I, there's some things that we're going to go over this morning in, our, in the morning message, and I know for a fact you've heard some of those things before. And you know what I'm convinced of? You need to hear them again. You say, why? Because I need to hear him again. By the way, can I say this? Um, I, I asked my, uh, the, the lady that cuts my hair, I said, who do you go to to get your hair cut? She goes, that's so funny you asked that. She goes, because I think to myself, do you ever go to your doctor and go, who's their doctor? <laughs> do, do you ever think that way? I do. You know, who cuts your hair? Who's your doctor? Who's your dentist? You know, if you're talking to a dentist, if you're talking to a pastor or a preacher, you go, well, who's your preacher? You know what? I'm getting fed all week long. I'm listening to CDs. I'm listening to tapes. I'm, yes tapes. They're about that big. And you put them in a player, a cassette player. I have one in my 2007 Highlander, okay? Uh, and, and, and I'm listening to stuff all week long. You say, why? Because I need to be stirred up. Because I need to be fed. Because I need to be told things that I already know, that I've heard a thousand times, and I still am not doing like I ought to be. Look at verse number uh, 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always. Always in remembrance. You say, what is that? Man, that is an exhortation right there. That's an exhortation. Uh, go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, when Paul is departing, and you're reading about Peter departing in 2 Peter, when Paul is departing, you can read about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul's come to the end of his life. And you know that by the context, uh, look if you would at verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered. You say, what is that? Like a sacrifice. He knows he's going to face the, uh, his death. And it says, and the time of my departure is at hand. So we know this is the end of Paul's life, right? Look what he tells uh, young Timothy in verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. If all you ever got was exhortation, and you never got the reproof, and you never got the rebuke, you know what you're going to think? You're going to think God is Santa Claus. If all you ever get is reproof and rebuke, and you never get exhorted, you're going to think that God is Zeus, and He's got a lightning bolt in His hand, just waiting for you to mess up so He can zap you. You know what you need? You need all of it. That's a balanced diet. But exhortation is part of that, being stirred up to continue on for Jesus Christ. All right, so go back to uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And on the heels of that, as Paul mentions to those Thessalonian Christians there in verse 3, the, uh, the type of exhortation that they brought and the motive behind it, I want you to see a principle called stewardship here in verse number 4. All right? In verse number 4, it says, But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Now, uh, number 5 in your study guide, if you will, it says in verse 4, we learn about a stewardship with the gospel. You are a steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, go to 2 Corinthians real quickly. Keep your hand here. Go to 2 Corinthians. And I, I've met some Christians that, that believe that, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't have any kind of ministry, I don't have any kind of thing that I can offer to the Lord. But that's not true. Uh, if you're saved, you have a ministry. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, 
You know one of the blessings of reading uh, uh, ink and paper Bible? Now listen, I've used the, the, the phone Bibles and stuff like that. I'm not saying it's wicked or anything like that. Uh, but you know one of the blessings of having a, a Bible that you read day in and day out? I could not remember the reference I was supposed to tell you guys. But I knew it was on this side of the page and it was over here. And I'll tell you what, you read your Bible consistently, the Lord will do that for you. All right? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and look if you would at verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us. Now, let me remind you, the Corinthian church was the most carnal church in the New Testament. You know what you have in the Corinthian church? You've got people, uh, you've got a man in fornication, sleeping with, the Bible says, his father's wife. That's a mess, that's a problem, I would say. All right? You've got Christians that are suing each other in secular courts. That's a problem. You've got them abusing the Lord's Supper. That's a problem. You've got them abusing the gift of tongues. That's a problem. This is a very carnal group of people. And yet he says to them, God given to us. It doesn't matter uh, uh, you know, whether you say, well, I'm not living right. Well, get right. I mean, you still have this ministry. It's not going away. Once you're saved, you have this ministry. Look at it in verse 18. And have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Look at verse 20. Now then, we, who's the we? Paul and the Corinthians. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. You know what that is? That is a stewardship of the gospel. God has given you, once you're saved, God says, okay, this gift that you have received, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says, how shall they hear without a preacher? If you're saved in here today, somebody in some way, shape, or form told you. It could have been a gospel tract that they handed you, and you read about the gospel, and you said, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. It could have been watching, I've heard of people getting saved watching a Billy Graham crusade. It could have been coming to church and hearing the gospel. Maybe it was this, this guy that just wouldn't shut up about Jesus at work, and finally you got to a place where you go, there's something to this. And you trusted Jesus Christ. But the point is this. Someone brought that message to you. Different mediums of doing it, but someone brought it to you. You say, what is that? They were faithful with the stewardship of the ministry of reconciliation. And now it's your turn to do the same. What if everybody in this room just won one person to Jesus Christ in the next year? Do you know what that means? That means you're looking at another 25 people that, that would have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior in 2017. That's a big deal, guys. You can't put a price tag on that. And, and you know what I think what happens sometimes is that people think, well, they're not all going to come to church. Maybe not. Maybe not. But guys, last I checked, the ministry of reconciliation is not just about growing your church and filling it up. Well, do we want that? Sure. Praise the Lord when it happens. But it's about you being faithful with the message that God gave you about the grace of God in your life. Think about all that has happened in your life since you've been saved. Think about all the things that God has shown you, all the things that the Lord has taught you. Think about how real the Bible is. Do you remember looking at the Bible before you were saved and going, man, what's that all about anyways? You know, and, 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 and to think, for example, that you're this person now that would walk up to somebody and say, hey, can I give you something that tells you about Jesus Christ and what he did for me? Fast, or rewind 20 years ago, you go, man, that's a religious fanatic. What's wrong with him? I would never be like that person. And there you go yourself now. Praise God. That's not a bad thing. But think about all that God has done in your life since you've received that message. Don't you want to give that to somebody else? Paul says that we were allowed. Can I say this? It is not just an obligation. Sometimes as preachers, we make the mistake to emphasize or maybe overemphasize the obligatory part of being a Christian. But there's also an opportunity. It's not just obligation. And if you wake up and go, oh, I, gotta, I have to read my Bible. Can I say this? There's some Christians in China that wish they could read their Bible. There's some Christians in China right now that wish they could do what we're doing right now. And some of them do it underground, hoping that they're not caught. Listen, you ought to wake up and say, I can read my Bible. I can tell somebody about Jesus Christ today. I can say no to sin. You say, what is it? It's the opportunity that's there. The Bible says, and I want you to go back, go back to 1 Thessalonians. I want you to see this, and I really want you to get it in your heart and in your mind. 
what Paul is trying to express to the Thessalonians is not just an obligation, but rather an opportunity. And an opportunity that he's saying, look, we, the ministers that came to you, God gave this to us. And now we're passing it on to you. We want you to see this the same way. All right, look at uh, verse number four. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Man, that's a blessing. That is a blessing. God allows you. You know, I, I've thought this several times. I've been saved for about 24 years. I got saved when I was 11 years old at Silver State Baptist Youth Camp. Um, some of you know my story. I was raised semi-Catholic, I guess you could say. Uh, my, you know, my family's from Puerto Rico, so you're, you know, to be born in Puerto Rico, it's like almost automatic assumption you're going to be Catholic, for the most part. A lot of Latin America is that way. And, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, hearing the gospel, understanding that Jesus died, but it wasn't until I was 11 years old that I realized that Jesus died for me. And I had to make a personal choice to receive him as my Savior. And in the last 24 years of, of Christian living, there's some things that I've learned. I, I'm sure you would say the same. And one of those things that I've thought about, and I, I've thought and thought and thought about, is, Lord, why did you do this the way that you did? You see what I mean? Why didn't the Lord send the angels to just go and preach to everybody? Now listen, there's going to be an angel that's released in the book of Revelation during the time of tribulation. And that angel goes out and says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for this is the whole duty of man. You read about that in Revelation. There's that. But man, as it relates to the gospel of the grace of God, that very sweet message that we have in our hands, He didn't commit it to the angels. He didn't commit it to the cherubims. He didn't commit it to the four and twenty elders that sit around His throne and give Him praise all the time. He didn't commit it to the four beasts that sit around His throne and give glory to Him. He committed it to us. And you understand the great fallacy that exists in the human experience, all right? We are, we are broken. We are fallen. We are far from perfect, even after salvation. Can I get an amen there? Amen. amen. We are saved sinners. Uh, we sing the song, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace, right? Now, it's funny because we sing that, but anytime anybody reminds us, that's what we are. Who do you think you're talking to, you know? But you are. It's what we are. And God gave us that message. And he entrusted us, knowing that we weren't always going to do right with it. But it's in your hands today. What are you going to do with it? Who are you going to tell today? Look, there's going to be opportunities when you leave this place to go and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I pray that you take them. This week at work, you're going to tell somebody? Well, what would you do over the weekend? Isn't that a great open liner? Oh, let me tell you something. I learned about the greatest person I've ever known about. Don't tell them you went to church. Don't do that. That's going to end the conversation right there, all right? Tell them when they ask you. No, I'm serious. When they ask you, what did you do this weekend? Man, I had a great time with my family. We did this. We did that. And man, I was excited to learn about the greatest human being that I've ever heard about in my entire life. <laughs> Who's that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Amen? That'll work. Look back there at verse number four. He says there in the latter half of that verse, Even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Uh, you've got a choice to make as a Christian today, and that is whether you are going to be a man pleaser or a God pleaser. And uh, when Paul gives instruction to the Ephesians, I believe he does this in Colossians as well, he talks about those that are working for their masters. If you want to put it in today's context, your employer, a servant or employee to an employer, servant to a master. And he says this, not with eye service as pleasing men, but as pleasing God. You say, why? Uh, because that takes it up a whole other level. And when Paul is talking here in verse 4, he said, look, I didn't tell you the things that I told you so you would like me. And I can tell you right now, there are things that I... I wish I didn't even have to preach on, to be honest with you. There's some things I'd rather just avoid. You say, why? Because you'd like me more. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I would be more like, well, and, and you would never walk out going, man, why do you have to get on that? And what's his problem? Who does he think he is? And what is all that all about? I, I'd like to avoid some of those things. But you know what Paul says here in verse 4? He says, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God. Why? Because he's the one that trieth our hearts. Look at Proverbs chapter 17, about the Lord trying your heart. And we're going to talk about the heart this morning in the message. Proverbs chapter 17. 
Proverbs 17, look if you would at verse number 3. The fining pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold. Now, if you understand anything about metallurgy, you understand anything about the refining process of gold and silver, you know what you learn about it? There is heat that's applied to the metal to bring to the surface the dross, is what the Bible calls it. And that dross is the stuff that has no, it, it, it's the stuff that diminishes the quality of the metal. And so that dross comes to the surface when heat is applied. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Sometimes the Lord does, he applies some heat to bring out the things that are way down in the heart. Not so that, listen, can I say this? God doesn't try us so that God can see what's in there. God already knows. It's not like God's going, oh, that's how they're going to react. <laughs> He knows before it happens. I mean, he would tell the people that when he was ministering to them, he would tell them, hey, why are you thinking this way? And, the, and people are going, well, how do you know what's in my head, you know? Because he's God. The Lord doesn't have to sit there and go, he's not doing it for his benefit, he's doing it for yours. And the Bible says that the fighting pot, as it says there, is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord, what? Trieth the hearts. The Lord is the one that tries the hearts. And that's why Paul says, look, I could have come speaking nice, flattering words. You would have liked me. You would have uh, enjoyed our time together more. There's some things that I didn't want to have to tell you, that, but they were necessary for you. And I did it because I was doing it for God. And that's a, an example. That is a sign of a real minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this. And, and just be honest. You don't have to raise your hand. Have there ever been people in your life who you really wanted to tell the gospel to but you knew that if you did, they weren't going to like you. And you think to yourself, and you weigh it back and forth in your mind, and you go, well, that would have been a good opportunity, but if I say this, they're just, ah. And you know, I, if I want to make it ahead in this company, I can't be that weirdo that talks about the Bible. <laughs> Did it ever go through your mind? Can I, can I say this? It'd be far better to stand in front of Jesus Christ and to look straight into his eyes with no regrets, about the opportunities he gave you to speak to people about him. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord is the one that tries the hearts. Now we're going to try to wrap this up here momentarily. 1 Thessalonians, you understand that's, uh, that when preachers say that, they're lying. You know that, right? <laughs> Momentarily, it could be an hour. I mean, it's a subjective word. You understand that, right? I mean, for God, all right, the Lord, with the Lord, you know, one day is a thousand years. So for a preacher, momentarily, it could be several hours, all right? Uh, I jest, of course. But look at, uh, look at verse number five. For neither at any time used we flattering words, underline it, that's important, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Now let me give you uh, some parallel passages of Scripture here. Uh, if you're going to take notes to what you just read in verses 5 and 6, I will give you 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, talking about verses 5 and 6 here in the passage. And I'd also give you 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 5 and 6. Now, those things run hand in hand because Paul is describing his own ministry. And he lets them know, look, I gave it to you in so many words. I gave it to you straight. I didn't come in with a cloak of covetousness. You say, what is a cloak of covetousness? I'm going to tell you what I think you're going to like to hear so that I can get from you what I want. Do you understand that's what a lot of modern preaching is? I'm going to tell you how wonderful you are, so you leave your money in the plate, and you come back next week and do it again. Now listen, that, that's not Christianity, guys. And I can tell you the Apostle Paul was not so concerned. Listen, he describes his ministry in a little bit here as being gentle as a nurse cherishing her children, but he still had to tell them the truth. All right? That is the ministry that's committed to all of us, is the truth-telling ministry. Now look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll look at a few verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and you know what's really interesting is uh, the, the book that I'm, I'm reading to you from this Bible, 
was published, this particular Bible, King James Bible, was published 400 and what, four, five, 405 years ago. And uh, a lot of people say it's archaic, it's hard to follow, that kind of thing. Here's what I've learned, though. Here's the funny thing. The preachers that, for the most part, stick with this book, they preach it straight, and you don't miss at all what they're saying. When the, the service is done, you understood exactly what was said. I've been in some churches where they've got something that's supposed to help you understand things more, and the guy's using so much Greek, I'm going, I don't know what he just said. I have no idea what he's talking about. You say, why? Look at uh, chapter 2, and we're going to go through this and see what Paul says about this. Uh, look at verse 1. I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Now, you know, I'll be honest with you. Some Christians today, if they heard the Apostle Paul, they'd go, you know what? I know what he's saying is right. I just don't like how he said it. Are you hearing me? You say, why? Because he says of himself, I mean, all the time, guys, we talk about, Man, John the Baptist, a great man of God. If John the Baptist came today, not showered, wearing, you know, a uh, 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 camel's uh, 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 fur and, and just stinking to high heaven, eating locusts and wild honey, and he shows up here and he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You know, <laughs> I mean, no one in here would be like, yeah, I like that preacher. I, get, I, I tell you this, he would have zero followers on YouTube. <laughs> All right. So, so what I'm getting at is oftentimes we look at these great men of God, but we forget if we were their contemporaries, we probably wouldn't like them a whole lot. You know what that tells you about real Bible preaching? It's not always about what we like. It's about what's good for you. You parents tell your kids all the time, eat your vegetables. I don't want to eat my vegetables. Eat them, right? You know, if you know what's good for you, eat your vegetables, right? And they go, no, I don't want to eat it. You say, why? And you say, well, mom, mom, it tastes yucky. Yeah, but it's good for you. You know, there's some things in the Christian life that taste yucky, <laughs> You don't always like it. Your flesh doesn't always like it, but it's good for you. And Paul says here, he says, uh, I determine not, look here in verse 2, not to know anything among you, say Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know what Bible, real Bible preaching should do for your life? It should stir you up and it should change you. And at the end of it, it's something that can last in your life because it wasn't about the great speaker. It wasn't about, oh man, he's just so wonderful and he's so funny and he's just so great. It's not about that. It's about the book. It's about God's words coming across you in a way where you can get it and apply it in your life. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. We'll close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. I, I mean this when I say this. Uh, there are times where, you know, you've got to get on some things that aren't pleasant for everybody to, 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 to listen to, and I understand that. Uh, if you've ever been a manager at work, there are things you have to say you don't want to say. If you've ever been a father, if you've ever been a leader in any capacity, there are things that have to be discussed that not everybody's going to go, yes, I love talking about being punctual and, and, and my perfect attendance at work. Most employees, when you talk about punctuality and the importance of it, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, there's some things in church and in the Christian life that are that way too. All right? But why are they said? For your good. That's why God gave them to us. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at, uh, look at verse number, oh, let's see here, verse 4. For if he that cometh preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached... Or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. He's talking about a false preacher coming in and, and preaching to them, and basically him saying, look, you probably would like this guy. Why? Because he's not like me. Look what he says about himself. Verse 5. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be what? Rude in speech. Yet not in knowledge. But we've been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. And he goes on, and, he, and he, he basically, in chapter 11 in the Second Corinthians, he's defending his ministry to those people, which he shouldn't have had to do. It's a carnal church he's dealing with. We understand that. But uh, again, back in 1 Thessalonians, when Paul describes, let's go back there, and we'll close in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, when Paul describes the manner in which he brought the message and the manner in which he executed his ministry to them, he's saying, look, I didn't, I didn't do this in a way that was going to flatter you. I didn't do it in, in a cloak of covetousness. Uh, I didn't do it to get your applause or to get your glory. Uh, I did it because it was good for you and I love you. See, how do you know? Look at verse 7. For we were gentle among you, even as a nurse 
cherisheth her children. So being affectionate and desirous of you, we are willing to have imparted in you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. You know what you learn about? You learn about a ministry, a real New Testament ministry is one that provides for you what you need, not always what you want. Uh, don't forget, don't forget, guys, that in the Old Testament, the Jews said this, we want to be like the nations round about us, we want a king to govern us. And you know what they got? They got Saul. And they got what they asked for, and at the end of it, they weren't really happy. So, as a Christian, keep in mind, one of the greatest things that God can do for you is give you what you need, not what you always want. And ministry is the same way. Amen. We'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Any questions? No? All right. Let's, uh, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Brother Mark, if you would, let's all stand. Take a minute to stretch a little bit. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer, and we'll uh, start our morning service here in about 10 minutes. Use this as a great time of fellowship. Get to know your church family around you. And uh, don't forget, there's some coffee out here. I think there's tea, right, Miss Megan?